Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the West, episode 27, Reform and Revolution. We left off last time with peace being imposed between the Armagnacs and the Burgundians. The Peace of Auxerre, as the steel was known as, followed the same general trend of all the others over the past few years. Both parties were officially reconciled, while none of the underlying issues of the conflict were addressed. John the Fearless was not happy with this deal, as he had been hoping for the unconditional surrender of the Duke of Berry. But once an English force landed in Normandy with the purpose of supporting the Armagnacs, he recognized that his position was only going to get weaker, and so became willing to make peace. While neither the hardcore Armagnacs nor the Duke of Burgundy were in favor of the deal, the moderates on both sides had grown tired of the conflict, and during the Siege of Bourges, the Dauphin had become one of the most prominent of these moderates. While negotiations with the Armagnacs were ongoing, John the Fearless complained to Dauphin Louis that he was being too soft on their opponents, to which the Dauphin replied that the war had already gone on too long, that it was damaging to the kingdom and would hurt the king and the Dauphin himself in the long run. He added that the Armagnacs were his uncles, cousins, and other relations, and that he should expect to be well served by them in the future. As Richard Famiglietti wrote, quote, The Duke of Guienne had arranged a compromise, and John the Fearless was obliged to acquiesce. Louis was getting older and was beginning to chafe from the control of his father-in-law. More and more, the people and lords of France were looking to him, and he was growing concerned with the power that the factions had in the kingdom. But for now, he was still young, and still under the power of John the Fearless, if no longer under his control. Now that peace was restored between the Armagnacs and Burgundians, at least nominally, the question on everyone's mind was what to do about the English. Despite the Peace of Auxerre, an English army led by Thomas of Lancaster, the second son of Henry IV, was still marching through France, and as they no longer had the Armagnac sanction to attack the Burgundian royal army, their next moves would be unpredictable. The English army numbered around 8,000 and was joined by another 2,000 unreconciled Armagnac soldiers led by the Count of Alençon and Arthur de Richemont, a brother of the Duke of Brittany. As the Count of Alençon had not been party to the initial peace at Bourges, his lands were still occupied by Burgundian forces, and so Alençon was the first target of the army. But shortly after his lands were recovered, he received word that he was considered a party to the Peace of Auxerre, and so was expected to rejoin the fold. Not wanting to be the last Armagnac fighting, the Count of Alençon left the English, who were then left even more aimless than before. They could not simply return to England empty-handed, as Henry IV had staked a good deal of political leverage on the Armagnac alliance, and its failure would have likely led to his sidelining again. So Thomas of Lancaster decided to make his way through Anjou towards Orléans, making sure to pillage and raid as he went, for booty sure, but also to send a message to his erstwhile allies. Once the English reached the Orléanist city of Blois, they made their displeasure known and entered into negotiations for a peaceful withdrawal from France. As the English had been invited in by the Armagnacs, the Burgundians and the royal court were firm on pushing the cost of withdrawal onto them. After about two months of negotiation, which included the occasional raid into Orléans or Berry, the Dukes of Berry, Orléans, and Bourbon agreed to pay the English 210,000 francs for the army to leave without any further pillaging. However, while the English did make their way to Bordeaux, the full sum would not end up being paid, due in part to the devastation that the lands of the Armagnacs had experienced from the Burgundian, Royal, and English armies and due in part to the fact that things will change drastically in a few years. Still, what was paid to the English did outweigh the cost of the expedition, and demonstrated that there was profit to be made for an English army in France. Furthermore, when the English army reached Guienne, Thomas of Lancaster reaffirmed his alliance with the two remaining unreconciled Armagnac princes, the Count of Armagnac himself and the Lord of Albret. Both men controlled important territories near English Guienne and had taken part in Louis of Orléans' previous attempts to seize it. This deal served to significantly strengthen the English position in the duchy, as well as to reaffirm the English commitment to the Armagnac cause, even if the wider Armagnac commitment was on the back burner. <laughs> 
Before we return to Paris, we have some more business with the English to address. In early 1413, Henry IV of England died, and Prince Hal was crowned King Henry V. We saw how Prince Hal had supported the Burgundians while his father had backed the Armagnacs, so now that a new king was in power, both sides of the French Civil War had opportunities to make their cases once more. For now, we'll leave Henry V to get settled onto the throne, but I have a feeling that we'll be seeing him again soon. Now back to the end of 1412. Peace in the kingdom had been restored, and John the Fearless was still in power. But there were undercurrents of tension as the Armagnacs tried to rebuild their influence, and Louis of Guienne worked to establish his own position, independent from his father-in-law. A visible example of this occurred in late 1412, when the body of Jean de Montague was removed from the gibbet that it had been hanging on for the past three years, and was reburied with honors. Montague had been one of John the Fearless's greatest adversaries in the years after the assassination of Louis of Orléans, and the Duke of Burgundy arranged his execution when he returned to Paris and consolidated power after the Battle of Oti. In the years since, Montague's body remained a display of the power of the Duke of Burgundy and a warning to his enemies, and the removal of this body was thus another way that the Dauphin worked to mend fences and create his own moderate power base. In fact, the Peace of Auxerre, which was very much the Dauphin's peace, made power sharing between the factions a central tenant. Although the Duke of Burgundy officially signed on to the peace, he was loath to let go of any of the power that he had accumulated, or allow his supporters to be displaced from their recently acquired offices. A prominent example of this was the Count of Saint-Paul, who had recently been named Constable of France, replacing the Armagnac-aligned Charles d'Albret. In the aftermath of the peace, Valeron of Luxembourg refused to give up the office, and with John backing him, he was able to remain constable, and thus the Lord of Albret remained unreconciled with the court. Valeron of Luxembourg also remained in possession of the formerly Orleanist castle of Cousy, and there were many other Burgundian officers occupying positions and sometimes lands which had been previously held by Armagnacs. The addition of Armagnac partisans to the royal council in the aftermath of Auxerre ended up grinding the gears of government to a halt, and France was soon facing a crisis of government. This crisis was only exacerbated by the fact that the royal treasury was empty. Not only had the civil war interfered with the collection of taxes and other royal revenues in recent years, but it had also been a drain on the royal finances. John the Fearless had gotten the king to fund a large portion of the Burgundian war effort, and the royal campaign to Bourges was an incredibly expensive undertaking just by itself. So hoping to kill two birds with one stone, John the Fearless began to push for the Estates General of Languedouille, or Northern France, to be called, which could potentially approve new taxes and financial reforms, and help the Duke of Burgundy cement his hold on power at the expense of the Armagnacs. The last time that the estates had been called was in 1380, near the end of Charles V's life, and it had gotten superseded by the Mayotan Revolt in Paris, which I briefly covered in episode 9. Charles V had called one other session of the Estates General in 1369, which had been a carefully managed affair, as the estates could be hard to control. But if there's one meeting of the Estates General that we should keep in mind going forward, it would be the one summoned in 1358, which was co-opted by Charles the Bad and Etienne Marcel. Review episode 6 for that one. John the Fearless was trying to repeat Charles the Bad's strategy and use the push for reform that the estates carried to cement his hold on power. The Duke of Burgundy was popular with the radicals of the industrial cities of the north, who always tended to have an outsized impact on the meetings of the estates. And while this tapping into populist opinion ended up blowing up in the King of Navarre's face, John was confident that he would be able to tame the beast. When the estates first convened in January of 1413, John's confidence seemed well-placed. For one, the Northeast ended up being overrepresented compared to the rest of Languedoc, with Paris, Picardy, and John's territories being especially present. Furthermore, the Armagnac princes did not attend in person, and instead sent proxies, which limited their involvement and influence the meetings would be dominated by representatives from the northern towns and by the University of Paris, further increasing the pro-Burgundian position of the estates. 
The estates opened with a speech from the Dauphin's chancellor, Jean Daniel, a Burgundian appointee. Daniel assured the gathered representatives that the Peace of Auxerre marked an end to the conflict of the past few years, and that now, more than ever, the people of France needed to unite behind the king and Dauphin to drive the English out of France. Thomas of Lancaster was still in Bordeaux and represented a threat, and France needed men and money to secure the kingdom. The next few days allowed for the regional delegations to address their grievances to the assembly. Each set of grievances was familiar. The delegates harped on the high salaries paid to royal officials and the corruption of said officials. Furthermore, the means of oversight of the officials was ineffective and often just as corrupt as the officials themselves. These grievances also included complaints about the ineffectual response to the English invasion of the previous year and demands that defenses and garrisons be upgraded and maintained to better defend against a future one. And of course, one of the loudest and most often repeated complaints had to do with royal taxes. The taxes were too high. Many of them were unfairly shouldered on the poor and middle class, while the rich nobles had exemptions. Many of the rights of royal taxation had been granted to the regional lords, and so much of it was funneled right into the pockets of those lords, and thus would not get used for defense. And even the funds that did make it to the royal treasury would often get misused. So while the king and kingdom needed money, reforms would need to be made in order to justify additional taxation. And luckily for the estates, a seasoned reformer was in Paris. Many of the lists of grievances concluded with a statement of confidence in the Duke of Burgundy as one of the few men who could lead the kingdom out of crisis. This, of course, is conveniently ignoring the fact that the civil war sparked by the Duke of Burgundy was one of the major drains on the treasury and that many of the people drawing salaries from the royal government were now Burgundian-aligned officials. Jonathan Sumption wrote, quote, The government was bankrupt and had reached the limits of the country's taxable capacity. The only solution was a severe pruning of public expenditure. For many years, the main problem had been the appropriation of royal tax revenues by the princes, but the Parisian roll of abuses were silent about that for the only significant beneficiaries since the crisis of 1411 had been the Duke of Burgundy and his friends. Instead, they concentrated on the cost of the various royal households and on the bloated administration of the state. Admittedly, the royal household had also exploded in size and cost in the past few years, and the royal administration was a corrupt and expensive mess. However, The extent to which this was the true cause of the financial crisis was overstated in the estates, much to the benefit of John the Fearless. But to be fair to the estates and their support for John the Fearless, the Duke of Burgundy's reforming zeal appears to have been more than just a cynical ploy for power, not that there wasn't also an element of that going on. In his own territories, John the Fearless worked to simplify the administration and cut salaries wherever possible. He also set up several commissions to oversee his civil service and root out corruption. Therefore, many of the proposals that the estates wanted to enact in France, John had already enacted in his own lands, albeit with varying degrees of success. When all the grievances had been presented, the Dauphin pledged to support the program of reform and was cheered rapturously. The king had once again become absent, and so the pressure of dealing with the estates general, which was constantly growing more radical, and more hostile towards royal expenditure, was placed on the shoulders of a teenager. The first move was to appoint a commission to investigate the corruption in the government and propose a specific reform agenda. And unsurprisingly, this commission was filled with Burgundians. Shortly after this commission got to work, more purges of the administration followed. Unlike the previous purges, this one did not only target Armagnacs, but instead did actually work to root out corruption in the administration. It's just that most of the targets had worked to remain neutral, and all of their replacements were strident Burgundians. The shakeup was widespread, and many long-serving and admittedly corrupt royal officials lost their jobs, with some being imprisoned as well. But, to be fair to this commission, the administration of the kingdom was quite corrupt, and many of the most corrupt officials had avoided picking one side or another thus far. Therefore, this purge was not only a tool of Burgundianization, Furthermore, the most corrupt Burgundian-aligned officials were not spared. Men such as the provost of Paris, Pierre Dessart, and the provost of the merchants, Pierre Jeanton, 
had spent years as fervent Burgundians, but were both dismissed, and consequently turned on John the Fearless, which only led to their further alienation. In the aftermath of his dismissal, Pierre de Sar proclaimed that the Duke of Burgundy was the biggest looter of them all, a likely true accusation that only ended up putting a Burgundian target on his back. Before we go further, we need to talk about the Butchers and the University of Paris. The Butchers of Paris were one of the largest guilds in the city. They tended to be well-off for laborers, but they were denied many of the political offices and responsibilities that the more prestigious guilds had. And, importantly for the Duke of Burgundy, the butchers, and related trades such as the skinners, fielded an imposing militia, as these professions were made up of strong men used to using knives. The University of Paris was an altogether different beast, made up for the most part of doctors of theology, and often found giving advice to the king and high nobles of France. The university tended to support a reforming program, and had forged an alliance with the Duke of Burgundy, going back to John's initial conflicts with Louis of Orléans and the kidnapping of the Dauphin. The students of the university did occasionally provide John the Fearless with a pool of manpower, but the University of Paris's moral authority was their more useful tool. For example, scholars from the university were instrumental in securing the excommunication of the Armagnacs back in 1411. The butchers and their militia, the University of Paris, and the Duke of Burgundy allied with each other to strengthen their grip on the city. But John's alliance was not quite as stable as he might have liked. At the end of the day, all three groups had different aims. The butchers and the other radical workers were mostly motivated by day-to-day -day economic concerns, while the University of Paris supported a more moderate reforming agenda aimed at good governance. It is true that the university was split between radicals and moderates, and while the radicals had the initiative at the moment, they would not forever. Meanwhile, the Duke of Burgundy was mostly concerned with maintaining his grasp on power in Paris and rooting out corrupt and unfriendly officials from the administration. The Duke of Burgundy's aims were thus much closer to those of the University of Paris than the butchers, but the butchers provided him with a crucial pillar of physical support, and so he in turn was forced to support them. As the commission filtered through the royal government and the process of reform began, the people of Paris wanted more, while the non-Burgundian nobles still in the city were alarmed by its rapid pace and continual radicalization. The Duke of Anjou, who had maintained a moderate pro-Burgundian posture throughout the past year, decided to quit Paris, as did many of the other nobles. Other moderate Burgundians, or slightly pro-Burgundian nobles, such as Louis of Bavaria and the Duke of Bar, began to slowly move away from the Burgundian camp as well. The Duke of Berry remained in the city and was one of the few prominent Armagnac lords to do so, but he remained as unpopular as ever and was a constant target of popular wrath. In this tense political atmosphere, the Dauphin worked hard to escape from his father-in-law's influence. In March of 1413, the Duke of Guienne dismissed the Burgundian Jean Daniel from his office as chancellor. From there, he continued to shake off the Burgundian influence in his household. He employed several neutral and even anti-Burgundian officers, such as Charles de Montague, son of the late Jean de Montague, and took counsel more and more with Armagnac princes, such as the Count of Vertu, son of the late Louis of Orléans. All of these moves alienated the people of Paris, and soon the Dauphin was making plans to flee the capital and the mob. However, word of his plans leaked out, and John the Fearless found himself in a sticky situation. He could not directly move against the Dauphin, as that would be treason and grounds for his dismissal from government, or worse, and he could not allow the Dauphin to leave Paris and be totally surrounded by anti-Burgundian officials and nobles. But, luckily for the Duke of Burgundy, he had allies in the butchers, whose acts gave him a thin veil of plausible deniability. Pierre de Sar had returned to Paris to help the Dauphin in his planned flight from the city, but rumors soon spread through the capital that he was there on behalf of the Armagnacs to abduct the king and Dauphin. A crowd then gathered, which included many butchers, radicals from the University of Paris, supporters of the Duke of Burgundy, and even some of John the Fearless's household knights. This crowd was led by Elion de Jacques Vier, a chamberlain of the Duke of Burgundy, who had become his representative to the mob, Jean de Troyes, a radical Parisian alderman, and Simone Caboche, 
a Skinner whose name will become attached to the coming uprising. Royal officials tried to get the mob to disperse, but to no avail, and when the crowd learned that Desar was holed up in the Bastille, they marched on the fortress. When the former provost saw the crowd massing, he began to panic and begged them to be allowed to leave. He protested that he was not there to kidnap the Dauphin, but was there at his request. However, this revelation did not soothe the crowd. It only turned them further against the Duke of Guienne. As the Parisian crowd was about to attempt to storm the Bastille, the Duke of Burgundy arrived and convinced them to hold off. But while the attack was called off, the crowd would not disperse. Pierre de Sar agreed to hand himself over to John on the condition that the Duke would account for his safety. But just as this situation was winding down, the mob began to focus their ire on a new target, the Dauphin. Most of the crowd now began a march to the Dauphin's hotel. When the crown prince came to the window and asked what brought them here, Jean de Troyes launched into a tirade against the Duke of Guienne's lifestyle and circle. He finished his speech with a demand that the traitors who had turned the Dauphin away from the righteous path be delivered for judgment. When the Duke of Guienne protested that his advisers were men who had served him well and loyally over the years, de Troyes produced a list of fifty names and demanded that these be handed over. The Dauphin went inside, but the crowd was too riled up to wait, and broke down the doors of his hotel. Soon they were tearing through the palace and seizing anyone who they found on the list. John the Fearless had ridden ahead of the crowd and was already in the Dauphin's hotel, and, when the prince saw members of his father-in-law's household among the crowd, he accused the Duke of Burgundy of masterminding the assault. John the Fearless played this off by saying that the Duke of Guienne would know more once things have cooled down, and then left with the mob and their prisoners. In the days that followed, those names which had not been crossed off were hunted down and arrested as well. But the populace continued to grow more radical and paranoid. Rumors of a coming Armagnac attack on Paris swirled, accusations of treachery ran wild, and suspected anti-Burgundians were arrested or beaten in the streets, with a few even being lynched. Many Armagnacs who had returned to Paris after the Peace of Auxerre now fled the city, as did many with only tenuous connections to the faction. In a move that the son of Philip the Bold could not have been too fond of, the more militant members of the mob, now called the Cabochon, adopted the white hoods that the Gentinar militia wore during the Ghent War. And around this time, it seems that the Duke of Burgundy's grasp on events began to slip. He was still popular with the radicals, but couldn't simply order them around, and it seemed like they now had a mind of their own just like the Dauphin. Emily Hutchison wrote, quote, There was a conscious attempt by the Cabochon to disassociate themselves from the Duke of Burgundy. The white hoods were reminiscent of the hoods worn by the Flemish during the urban uprisings in the early 1380s, and were therefore symbolic of urban strength and power. Although their victims were certainly the Duke of Burgundy's political rivals, they nonetheless had their own agenda. Louis of Guienne's household was moved to the Hôtel Saint-Paul, and guards were posted by the palace and on all the gates of Paris to prevent another planned flight. Throughout the Civil War, both sides had accused whoever was in possession of the king and Dauphin of imprisoning them, but now it appeared to be true. One of the leaders of the Cabochiens, a radical friar named Eustache de Pavilly, seemed to put a special emphasis on the need to re-educate the Dauphin, he looked on disapprovingly at the rich party-boy lifestyle that the prince was leading, and believed that he needed to change his ways. De Pavilly harangued the Dauphin for hours at a time, surrounded by an intimidating mob, making allusions to the fate of Louis of Orléans and threatening the Dauphin with disinheritance. In late May, King Charles made a partial recovery, and the Cabochia took the opportunity to justify their actions to him and present another list of enemies to be arrested. Much to Queen Isabeau's horror, her brother and several members of her household appeared on it. John the Fearless tried to talk the butchers down, but was ignored, and stood by as they seized whoever they saw fit. The king was given a white hood, and made to put it on, in a show of solidarity. A few days later, the Cabochia returned, and interrupted a session of the royal council with their demands. These demands included the retroactive approval of their actions, the dismissal from their offices of everyone arrested by the Cabochia, that those selected to replace the dismissed officers be approved by the people of Paris, 
and that the king approve an ordinance on reform, prepared by the special commission called for by the estates general, which were still meeting, by the way. The king agreed to all of these demands, and Charles proclaimed what has gone down in history as the Ordonnance Cabochienne. The Ordonnance Cabochienne was a huge and comprehensive program of reform. The reforms in the Ordonnance were mainly focused on limiting the size and pay of the administration and the households of the royal family, but there were some regulations on how petitions to the king were to be presented and accepted, and how the royal council was to operate when the king was absent. Sections of the Ordinance were also devoted to reforming taxation, the functions of the Parlement, land grants from the royal domain, and an increase of oversight of officials. Some offices were even made elective going forward, in another attempt to reduce corruption. However, we shouldn't overstate the radicalism of the Ordinance Cabochienne. Essentially, all of its contents had been recycled from previous reforming ordinances. Furthermore, while the Ordonnance is obviously associated with the Cabochian, it was only concerned with administrative reform and does not address the economic or social issues that the Cabochian themselves were most interested in. The thing that set it apart was not its content, but the size and scope of it. But shortly after approving the Ordonnance Cabochian, the king once more regressed, and legitimacy passed back to the Dauphin. Word spread that Louis of Guienne had written to the Armagnac princes asking for aid, and so the leaders of the Cabochia forced him to publicly issue a recantation. At this point, the Duke of Guienne had been backed into a corner. The king's formal acceptance of the Cabochia program and subsequent absence had emboldened the radicals. The king had declared that he forbade any moves against the reformers, which meant that if the Dauphin tried to undo them or push them out of power, he risked royal disfavor or even a possible charge of treason. The firebrand preacher, Eustache de Pavilly, had previously suggested that the Dauphin could be disinherited in favor of his younger brother, so the prince could not feel too secure in his position. Louis of Guienne's only out at this point was thus hoping that the king could recover his wits enough to be convinced to reverse his previous support of the Cabochian. But the Dauphin wasn't the only one losing the room to maneuver the Duke of Burgundy had also been forced into a corner by these events. As the revolt continued, the Cabochia began to focus on their own grievances, and John the Fearless lost his ability to steer events. He was still popular with the Cabochia, but they were unwilling to be directed by him. Furthermore, his support of the butchers and the Cabochia had alienated the princes, forcing him to further look to the mob for support, further alienating his princely allies. The increased radicalization of the Cabochia uprising also began to alienate the moderate reformers of the University of Paris, who once made up one of John the Fearless's most dependable blocks of support. These reformers, led by the theologian and former Burgundian Jean Gerson, began to ally with other Parisian burghers in an attempt to oppose the Cabochia. And soon a moderate party led by Gerson and the royal officer Jean Juvenel began to actively push back against the Cabochian. The moderates had backed away from supporting the Duke of Burgundy, and many had fled Paris. The Dauphin now feared and loathed his father-in-law, and looked to the Armagnacs as his only hope. And the Armagnac princes had heard the Dauphin's pleas. Since May, the Armagnacs had been meeting to discuss the situation in Paris, and by the end of June, plans had been made for yet another campaign into the Ile de France. The king had made another brief recovery in mid-July, and agreed to an Armagnac request to send a delegation to meet with them. As the Armagnac armies neared the capital, John the Fearless knew that he had to come to terms with them. The Duke of Burgundy was able to influence the choice of delegation, and so when the meeting occurred a few days later, the royal delegation was really a Burgundian one. John instructed his delegates to only listen to the demands rather than negotiate so they brought back the Armagnac terms to the Royal Council and the Paris Parlement. The Armagnacs demanded that a new peace conference be summoned, and that the terms of the Peace of Auxerre actually be enforced, i.e. that the Armagnac property, lands, and offices which had been seized be returned, and that a power-sharing agreement actually be reached. If these demands were refused, the Armagnac princes declared their aims of removing the king and Dauphin from the influence of the Parisian mob. Both the Burgundian-dominated Royal Council and the Parlement of Paris seemed inclined to accept these terms. 
The king then decided to send John the Fearless and the Duke of Berry to Pontoise to meet with the Armagnacs and make yet another peace. The conference at Pontoise began with the Armagnacs complaining about how all the previous peace deals had basically been ignored by the Duke of Burgundy, and that as the royal government had essentially ceased to function during the Cabochia Revolt, as princes of the realm, they declared themselves the representatives of the public good. Their demands boiled down to what had been discussed earlier, as well as the restoration of order in the capital, and a meeting between the Armagnac princes and the king, queen, and dauphin, outside of Paris and far from the Parisians. John the Fearless did not seem to be in a position to deny these requests, and so after about a week the peace was agreed to. But as the conference was going on, the Cabochia were doing their best to stir up the hostility of the Parisians to the Armagnacs in general, and the peace deal in particular. During a meeting of the aldermen of Paris, a group of Cabochia barged in to denounce the peace as a trick to give up the city to the Armagnacs, who were intent on destroying it. However, as many of the aldermen were middle-class burghers, they had grown tired of the revolt and wanted a return to peace and order. And it was not only the well-to-do who had tired of the revolt. When one of the aldermen was threatened by a butcher during the meeting, he responded that there were as many smiths as butchers in Paris. There were other guilds willing to defend peace. However, in this particular meeting, the butchers were still there in force, so the aldermen decided to pass the vote on the peace to the more local neighborhood assemblies, where it would be harder for Cabochia intimidation to be concentrated. On August the 3rd, those assemblies were called, and all but two voted to accept the peace. When the Parlement of Paris met to gather the results, Jean de Troyes attempted to denounce the proceedings, but as he began his speech, he was drowned out by calls of peace, peace. As the results of these votes were presented to the king, John the Fearless remarked gruffly that this is not the right way to do things, to which Jean Juvenel, the leader of one of the delegations, responded, the butcher's tactics give us no choice. The Dauphin then went to the window to announce the peace to the gathered crowd, who then erupted into cheers. The people of Paris had turned against the Cabochia radicals. A new militia was formed out of Parisians loyal to the Dauphin, and the next few days saw sporadic street fighting, as the Duke of Guienne's men worked to retake Paris from the Cabochia. As order was restored, the Dauphin released the prisoners captured by the Cabochia and arrested as many Cabochia leaders as he could. And now empowered, the Dauphin also worked to remove his father-in-law's influence from his household. Jean Daniel, who had been forced back on the Duke of Guienne as the revolt grew more radical, was once again dismissed as the Dauphin's chancellor, and this time replaced with Jean Juvenel. Many other Burgundian or Cabochia-aligned officials in his household, in the king's household, and in the administration were also dismissed, with a good portion of them being arrested as well. Jonathan Sumption writes, quote, The violent culmination of the Cabochia revolution was a disaster for John the Fearless. Forced to negotiate a peace with the Armagnac princes in July, he might have still salvaged something of his political power in the course of the horse trading that was expected to follow the return to Paris. His Parisian allies would have been protected by the amnesty for which the treaty provided. They would have remained in the city, a latent threat to his enemies, which John the Fearless knew how to use to good effect. As it was, the doomed rising of the Cabochia enabled the Dauphin to destroy them. Their work was undone within days. Despite the threat of an invasion of Paris, the Cabochia were brought down by their enemies in the city rather than their enemies outside of it. But the end of the Cabochia revolt did not mean that the Armagnacs were no longer planning a return to Paris in force. In fact, Charles of Orléans was currently gathering his armies for just that purpose. John the Fearless believed that he couldn't remain in Paris when the Armagnacs made their return, and even suspected that he might be arrested in the coming days. Now he began making plans to flee the capital, and even to take the king with him. The Duke of Burgundy planned a hunt with the king in the woods east of Paris and without royal attendance. When Jean Juvenel found out that the king was no longer in his apartments, he raised the alarm and eventually caught up with them. John protested that he was merely hunting with the king, but decided against returning to Paris with them, riding for Flanders instead. Not long after the Duke of Burgundy fled Paris, the Armagnacs made their return. The Duke of Orléans and his brothers, as well as the Dukes of Anjou and Bourbon and the Count of Alençon, 
rode into the city to a warm reception, much warmer than they had received after the Peace of Auxerre. And once the Armagnacs had installed themselves in Paris, the wholesale reversal of the Cabochia Revolution and the Burgundian hold-on government began. All the lands, titles, and offices which had been taken from the Armagnacs and their supporters were returned, and the royal council was now the playground of the Armagnacs. As much of the Cabochia Revolution and Burgundian purges had their excesses, these returns do mark an increase in the level of corruption in the French administration. Just as all the officers with links to Armagnacs had been dismissed over the past year, now anyone with a connection to the Duke of Burgundy was fired, with several being banished from either Paris or France as a whole. Jean Petit's justification of the Duke of Burgundy was even declared heretical, and the Ordonnance Cabochienne was revoked. However, it does not appear that this wholesale reversal was in the Dauphin's interests, and in fact, he found himself dominated once again, this time by Armagnacs rather than Burgundians. John the Fearless may have acted prematurely in fleeing the capital. As much as the Dauphin now loathed him, he also needed the Duke of Burgundy as a counterweight against an overmighty Armagnac party. Now the Armagnacs were ascendant and were pushing the French state in the opposite direction. Throughout the past few years, the Dauphin's goal had been to build his own base of support rather than be subsumed into either of the other factions. Therefore, the ensuing period of Armagnac dominance was little better than the previous one of Burgundian dominance, and we will see that the Duke of Guienne will still want to use the Duke of Burgundy to balance out the Armagnac princes. The ultimate goal of the Dauphin, as we saw in the Peace of Pontoise, was to create a compromised peace where all the princes would work together rather than empower one faction or another. However, now that the Armagnacs had taken power, they preferred to persecute the Duke of Burgundy and pursue justice for the murder of Louis of Orléans. Before we wrap up the episode, I want to examine what exactly the Cabochien uprising was. Many of the sources I've read take differing views on it, both in terms of its significance and its form. Some like to cast it as a proto-French revolution, and it does superficially bear many interesting similarities. It features a demonstration at the Bastille, a wide-reaching program of reform, the harnessing of popular violence by a political class, a phase of radicalization, and a reign of terror. However, I find this to be a misrepresentation of what the Cabochien uprising was. It fits much better into the established pattern of class warfare and urban revolts in the later Middle Ages that we've already seen many times in this show, such as Charles the Bad's and Etienne Marcel's uprising and the Mayaton in Paris, and the many urban revolts in Flanders, such as the 1302 revolt, the revolt of maritime Flanders, Jacob van Artevelde's uprising, and the Ghent War. Furthermore, the reform program of the Ordonnance Cabochienne wasn't really innovative. Richard Vaughn states, quote, It was not a revolutionary manifesto, but a detailed program of administrative reforms. This is not to say that the Ordinance was nothing special. It was quite ambitious, but it didn't represent a break with how things had been done. In fact, many members of the administration seemed disappointed that the Ordinance was being revoked, and this disappointment wasn't limited to Burgundian-aligned officials either. Finally, the reign of terror of the Cabochia Revolt is also overstated. Quoting Richard Vaughn again, quote, All the Cabochia affair amounted to, apart from the agitation for reform, was two serious riots on the 28th of April and 22nd of May, the murder of four suspected Armagnacs on the 28th of April, five or six executions in June and July, and less than 50 persons thrown in jail. It's obvious that intimidation and paranoia were widespread during the Cabochia uprising, but the violence seems to be played up in many of the retellings of the episode. In an ironic turn of events, one of the few people to get executed was Pierre Dessart, a man who took a leading role in the campaign against Jean de Montague. John the Fearless's role in events is likewise open for interpretation. He was obviously closely connected to the Cabochia, but was he directing them or merely exploiting the opportunities they gave him? Regardless, he seems to have lost just about all control over them as they radicalized, and in the end was too tied to them to avoid losing influence as they fell. His patronage of the Cabochia alienated the Dauphin, who moved decisively against him, 
but the Dauphin had been trying to establish a position independent from the Duke of Burgundy since 1412. Did the Cabochiao revolt really do much more than accelerate the course of events in that case? Richard Famiglietti argues that if John the Fearless had managed to keep his relationship with the Cabochians more hidden, he would have been able to weather their fall. And that may have been true, but as the Dauphin continued to grow up, he likely would have continued to pull away from the Duke of Burgundy, as King Charles did in 1388. Furthermore, while the Armagnacs reaped the rewards after the fall of the revolt, their threat of invasion didn't do much to end it. It wasn't even that the peace deal made was what ended the revolt, so much as it gave the majority of people who had grown tired of it an out. In the votes of August the 3rd, the majority of people in Paris rejected the Cabochiens and united behind the Dauphin in the name of peace. Therefore, the fall of the Cabochiens probably shouldn't be considered a rejection of the Duke of Burgundy and an embrace of the Armagnacs by the people of Paris, as it is sometimes portrayed as. The Cabochia seemed to have started with a fairly wide base of popular support, but as the situation grew tenser and the revolt dragged on, people began to tire of it and just wanted a return to peace. Their defeat came not from adversity so much as from apathy. But whatever it was, the Cabochia revolt or revolution is an interesting episode in French history and marks the end of John the Fearless's domination of the French court and royal government, at least for now. Next episode, we'll see how the Armagnacs wield power now that they're in charge, how John the Fearless will work on returning to power during his self-imposed exile from Paris, and how relations with the English will continue to deteriorate. Thank you so much to my patrons. Once again, I'm happy to announce that I have a new patron to thank, David Kraft von Bornem. And also, to Uldis, Duc de Chimay, Christine, Comte de Chenonceau, Elliot, Kraft von Kravenstein, Anthony, Comte de Chateauneuf-Nuxois, James, Kraft von Temsa, Preston, Comte de saint fargo Nicholas, Comte de Comari, Marc, Comte de Merceau, Diana, Kraft von Biersel, Mehmet, Comte Santerre, and Chris, Comte de Simor, and to my Knights of the Duchy. If you want to join them, you can at patreon.com slash Burgundy. If you want to support the podcast in other ways, you can do so by leaving a review on your podcast app of choice and telling your friends about the show. Both really help to grow the show and will earn you my everlasting appreciation. If you want to keep up with the show, you can follow me at Valois Burgundy on Twitter or Blue Sky, or find Grand Dukes of the West on Facebook. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest.com and check out the podcast website for maps, images, sources, and more at granddukesofthewest.com. Once again, thank you for listening.